Hi, I'm Keith Ghostland. I'm Ann Charles. I'm Linda Quinlan. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. It's uh, Tuesday, August 11th. Um, we would like to um, recognize that we're taping in Montpelier, which is unceded indigenous land. Um, I'd also like to prepare you for our interview show next week. We have three illustrious interviewees, including um, lesbian photographer Eva Weiss, who's going to talk a little about lesbian theater history in New York, as well as her work. So, welcome to the show, and now let's move on to Headlines with Keith. And since it's August 11th, hopefully that date stood out for you, because this was Vermont's primary day. And stay tuned for our next news show in two weeks, where we will be talking in greater depth about the results of the primaries. The things that people are watching you know, is what's happening with the Democratic governor, lieutenant governor, and some of us may be rooting for Debbie Ingram, um, and also looking at maybe somebody running in Winooski who might be the first out trans member of the House. Wouldn't that be nice? But there's also primaries happening in Minnesota, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Connecticut. <coughs> we, we got company today. And what we're going to be watching there is how the progressive movement within the Democratic Party fares within their primary. And Anne is over there grinning because she just heard who is the vice presidential no Democratic nominee just before we came up. But I'm going to let her share that if she wants because she's the one who told me. Um, also, trivia. Two options. If you get one, we'll give you credit. Out in the Mountains, August 1999. Front Page Story was talking about UVM's plans for their National Coming Out Day festivities, and they were inviting an LGBTQ performer. Who might that have been? And on August 11th, 1994, Stowe Performing Arts Center, out LGBTQ plus performer was the headline. And I'm told, actually they told me, they really enjoyed the Alpine slide. <laughs> Who might that have been? Want to do a, for events, a plug for Ten Fest, the Vermont Playwright Circle production. It is going to be online on August 22nd, 23rd. That's a Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. Registration is free, but it's Zoom. So if you Google Ten Fest Vermont, you can register 10 plays all Vermont playwrights, Vermont authors, including two of our favorites, Kim Ward and Devorah Zipkin. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping you're going to participate. We're also going to talk about LGBTQ plus book discussion groups <laughs> that during the Momentum Coffee Hour, and that's an ongoing event, someone associated with Rainbow Umbrella and whose name might be Linda Quinlan, <laughs> would like to know if you would be interested in participating in a discussion group. Do you know we have 10 people already signed up? All right. I know. And you had a suggestion of books. Yes. Other plug <laughs> is on Saturday, September 12th at Zero Gravity from 4 to 7, a safe get-together with DJ Craig Mitchell this is a fundraiser, and they're promoting it via Incredibly Proud Ale, which was the Pride brew that was released last year. Then we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit about the census, traffic stop data, and I'm going to talk a little bit about two incidents in Canada. Huh. All right. So, either one of you. <laughs> well, I guess, I, I guess that's my cue. Okay. Um, for my headlines, I have LGBT candidate advances. Oh, you already said this. I'm sorry. I'll take that off. In Washington, Kansas, and Michigan, you already said okay. that. Court has two victories for trans America. Former WWE wrestler says he killed a man who tried to rape him. 
Trans woman is stabbed to death at a vigil in Portland, Oregon. Uh, is it Meredith Corrigan, a Trump appointee, denounced the U.S. announced that the U.S. is a homo empire. <laughs> I wish <laughs> she was really <laughs> she was fired. <laughs> Who knows why? I, I would think that I've... Trump would have agreed with her, but anyway, she got fired. Um, a store posted a flyer that sells LGBTQ people spread diseases. Gay Atlanta City Council member Antonio Brown is indicted for fraud. He is accused of falsifying information to obtain loans. He says he will fight the charges and won't resign. He is charged with wire fraud, mail fraud, and bank fraud. So we have our own. <laughs> Don't we jest? <laughs> a stop on a rainbow crosswalk honors John Lewis's LGBTQ rights legacy. Um, Mackenzie Scott, the ex-wife of Bezo of Amazon fame, donates $1.7 million to LGBTQ agencies. You better get your grant in right away if you want any of that money. Gray, uh, gay Trump supporter is arrested defacing a Black Lives mural for the second time. Mm. Um, Detroit alt-right group targets an LGBT-owned bakery company. Mm. Actress Lily Reinhardt <coughs> opens up about being bisexual because she was inspired to come out after a Black Lives Matter vigil while standing with others in the LGBT community. Good for her. Marvel Comics portrays first ever same-sex wedding between two, per, two superheroes. And I have a picture of the two superheroes kissing right now. Uh, the Trump-Pence administration and its allies are continuing to prove that they are no friends of the LGBT community, as if we needed to be told mm -hmm. that. Yesterday morning, Trump's campaign se senior legal advisor, Jenna Ellis, intentionally misgendered Pennsylvania Health Secretary, Dr. Rachel Levine. Catholic Archdiocese of Detroit bars two LGBTQ Catholic uh, groups from holding mass using church facilities, Federal appellate court in Florida rules St. John's County School Board must allow students to use restrooms that match their gender identity. Uh, here's, well, I don't know. Everybody's going to have a different opinion about this, but gay mayor admits relationship with students but won't leave the race. Alex Morse is running for Congress from Massachusetts saying all of his relationships were consensual. He was a college teacher. Uh, let me see. Black Lives Matter has an LGBT roundtable with Patrice Cullors. Pamela Pell is a hilarious lesbian solver in Maple Worth Murders. The, oh, this is funny. The Jessica Fletchers and Miss Marbles of the world are finally getting a Randy lesbian equivalent in Paula Pell and John Lutz's Maplewood Murders on QB TV. Does anybody know what QB TV is? I've seen it, but no, I, I have no idea. Maplewood Murders? Maplewood Murders. Sounds like something to check out. I know. Yes. William Shatner tweets, uh -huh. cisgender is used to debase and harass him. Oh, Captain Kirk, I'm <laughs> so disappointed. <laughs> um, new Disney Plus documentary showcases the life of queer Disney hit maker Howard Ashman. He was only 40 when he died, and it's called Simply Howard. The ERA is queer and it's on Joe Biden's agenda for women. So those are my um, headlines. Wow. I have some headlines too. There's a lot of turmoil in Poland and I'm gonna spend my first segment trying to unpack it.
Good luck. I know. It's, it's been incredible. Um, following that, I have some unpleasant stories that I'm putting in the middle of my um, headlines. El Salvador police are sentenced in the nation's first trans murder convictions. This is both good and bad. Um, I have a picture now before you of Camilla Diaz, the young woman who was murdered. Uh, the police were summoned because there was some disruptive incident. They offered her a ride home and beat her, handcuffed her, put her face down in the squad car, beat her up, and left her by this side of the road. And she was found dead three days later. It's terrible for transgender people in El Salvador, um, but it's significant that this is the first trans murder convictions, and it's of police. There's uh, little concern because they weren't charged as a hate crime. It wasn't charged as a hate crime, but still one conviction, the first of the police, El Salvador. I guess it's progress, although it's terrible. Can I ask you a question? Why, Does yes. El Salvador have a hate crime statute? You can be charged with hate crimes. In El Salvador? In El Salvador. Okay. Thank you. I don't know that anyone has been. Okay. And I can give you... Um, no, I, I, I take you at your word. It's just some of the other, you know, other countries have, have not put that in place. Mm -hmm. Right. So we impose our own standard upon an assessment of, of what they have or have not done. Thank you. A twenty four a twenty fifteen law, Keith, ah, okay. allows for cases to be classified as hate crimes based upon gender identity, but it's not applied in this case. Okay. Thank and you. I wanna also explain that she was twenty nine. Mm -hmm. So um, more bad news. This is from the Cayman Islands, which is going the same road as Bermuda. They refused to pass a, dom a domestic partnership law. So now the British are going to have to step in and they're going to bring marriage. So they've shot themselves kind of in the foot here by refusing to pass a domestic partnership law. So that's the Cayman Islands. Is it under British rule? Uh-huh. It's the same as Bermuda, Bermuda, the Privy Council. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, a trans murder in Brazil. I have a picture before you now of Dorothy de Lima, who's 40. Um, she was sitting having a drink in the bar in a bar. Um, gunman came in, shot her 10 times. Um, someone has given out the story that um, she was that she had drugs, but she was the only person singled out and um, she had narcotics on her person, authorities say, but um, anyway, another trans murder. And Brazil is, has the highest murder rate of trans people in the world, I believe. Um, one more bad story. A Yemeni blogger has been jailed by a Saudi court for supporting an equal rights group equal gay rights group. He, he um, fled Yemen because of persecution, went to Saudi Arabia. Um, he was on Twitter. Apparently, he's like a social media personality. And someone on Twitter said, how do you feel about gay rights? And he said something very mild, like, I support them. And people should have equal rights. And um, he's been jailed. He may be in prison for two years. Um, he, he's, he may be deported too, which might be a good thing. So that's, that's the end of my bad stories, but then I have some interesting. New Zealand, this is on a positive note, New Zealand adds gender neutral title for voters ahead of polls. So elections coming up and people can um, identify themselves by their preferred gender and New Zealand will count the vote. Swedish pop sensation, Darren Zanyar comes out as gay and I was tempted to show you him singing one of his songs, but he's one of the most popular pop stars of Sweden and let's look at a picture of him now. He said, it took me a long time, but now I'm, 
I'm delighted to be my authentic self, Happy Pride. Um, and this is a story that I'm especially interested in and I'd like to pursue if there's time. An Australian government, officially, the Australian government officially recommends the use of gender, gender neutral language. Very exciting outcome in Australia and I hope to talk in more detail about it. Finally, in Panama, a July 16th statement has been made which um, may read down to the good of trans people. In Panama, they have a strictly segregated COVID-19 system where men can go out one day, women can go out one day. And if a man goes out on the wrong day, he's arrested. And of course, this, caused, this poses a great problem for trans people. So um, some of whom have been arrested, fined, and so forth. Oh so the government now has issued a statement on July 16th calling for um, an end to transgender discrimination and penalizing of transgender people, period. So presumably if they're out on the wrong day or if they're misidentified, it, uh, they won't be penalized. So, so you and I could go out on the same day? <laughs> that's right, we could. It's, you know, these gender segregated plans are just so problematic. I know. And what about Poland? I'm going to explore right. Poland during my first segment All in right. great detail. All Thank right. you for asking. I am ready. Okay. And, and from having read some of the stories, I... I'm thanking you in advance for making sense out of it. For I know me. I spent all morning reading about I, it. I so didn't mean to interrupt you. The, the first thing that I want to plug again, and, and you've heard me say this repeatedly, is the census. <laughs> However, there is a greater sense of urgency right now. As I had reported on previous shows, the remunerators, which are the people who are actually going door to door, because they were given the COVID precautions that they would need to use was going to be through October 31st. The federal administration has decided that, oh, we don't need that much time. We're stopping on September 30th. So an entire month's worth of face-to-face -face data collection is going to be lost. And the commentary has been that this is a <coughs> thinly veiled maneuver so that undocumented immigrant new Americans are not included in the count. Mm. And keep in mind that the census not only drives how much federal funding each state gets, but it determines their congressional districting how many House seats on the federal level each state is given is based upon their census data. And this is where, particularly through the South, it has been used to create those gerrymandered mm -hmm. districts that make no sense, mm -hmm. but it's based upon census population. I have a question for you. How yep. much bigger does Vermont have to get before it gets another representative? I would have to do some research on I it. I just was curious, like, because there's, there's so many people moving here and it's, it's getting a larger public. The, 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 it, it is thousands of, it, it, it is not a small amount, it is a fairly large amount. Okay. But I will, I will get information on that. The other thing is, you know, <clears throat> associated with the sort of looking at things that are happening within the federal administration, one of the things that people are going to be watching for the primaries is how states do with the mail-in and absentee ballots. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everyone has seen the newscast about, oh my, it is taking longer because the new postmaster general who owns stock in companies competing with the mm -hmm. post office mm -hmm. has cut overtime, changed protocols for which he has no understanding so they can't guarantee that your ballot is going to get to the city clerk on time unless your state now agrees to send it via first class mail versus bulk. Oh. I which heard, states can't afford. Which you can't afford, I know. I heard on NPR today briefly from, uh, they were interviewing someone I think in 
Iowa, who said that not only are they cramping how they're getting and, and not hiring people and letting mm -hmm. people go, but she said they took out one of their sorting machines. Yeah, and I left, mean, it, they had two, now they have one. And so now they can only sort, you know, in half the time they could before because they had two. And one of the things that they've also it's done amazing. is there for mail in ballots. I don't, anybody who's been in the back of a post office, there are all of the trays of mail. Well, all of the ballots are put in a tray, tray by themselves with this brightly colored sticker that goes in it that identifies it as ballots, they don't have enough of those. So they cannot clearly label. The um, other thing that's going to be coming up, and, and this is definitely something that we'll be talking about on our next show. On Tuesday, August 18th, the Vermont Public Safety is going to be releasing their traffic stop data. Now, why that is of importance to us is that it was the traffic stop data when they started releasing it, which really highlighted the embe embedded racial injustice that was occurring. More people of color were being <coughs> stopped and ticketed disproportionate to mm -hmm. their percentage of the population in general. And if you looked at you know, how often a person of color got a ticket versus a warning versus someone who was identified as white, there was a great disparity. So this is, you know, the implicit bias. This drove a lot of the, the changes in training of law enforcement. And then this coupled with, you know, George Floyd's killing um, is what prompted our legislature to start putting some guidelines in place for what law enforcement must report because some of the reporting relative to race mm -hmm. was <laughs> optional. Not all departments were reporting so that your data was inconsistent. You needed to look at you know, the number of cases reported and those for which you had information. Our legislature is requiring that there are essential elements that have to be collected with Good. each. And sort of what this applies to people in central Vermont is Rainbow Umbrella continues to meet with the new chief of police here in Montpelier. You know, Montpelier's data is going to be included in what is being released next week. Mm -hmm. So we can look at, you know, the number of times the Montpelier Police Department stops someone the sort of demographics that are associated with it, mm -hmm. ticket versus warning. But the other thing is that when you break it down onto the municipal level, the chief of police is going to know who wrote those tickets. Well, that's good. So that they in turn, he in turn could then look at, is there a pattern with specific officers? Mm -hmm. So if this is something of interest to you, Please get in touch with Rainbow Umbrella. Absolutely would like to hear your feedback. Also tagging on with the traffic start data and racial bias in Vermont, Burlington City Council. They are putting together a task force to look at concept of monetary reparations for residents who are descendants of slaves. You know, not only are they looking at what is the impact, what is has been the ongoing impact, and it's starting with, you know, the year 1619 when the slave trade really started coming wow. into America, how, how we've benefited and what it is we need, really need to do to make reparation for that. Mm -hmm. And part of, I'm, as, I keep, as Anne has something she's biting here, there's also... There would also be a resolution with an apology that's part of that. And this tags on to a House bill, H-478, that was introduced by Brian Sheena that looked at the state of Vermont formally apologizing for our state's role in the slavery trade. Good. Well, I just want to say, Linda and I watched a wonderful conversation last night between Isabel Wilkerson 
and Jacqueline Woodson. Woodson is a wonderful lesbian novelist whom we've read. And uh, Isabel Wilkerson, as most viewers know, has just published a best-selling, much lauded book called Cast, in which she, I think she might start in 1689, but in any case, in the Q&A, reparations came up. And she said, people really need to be educated right. and to educate themselves about this before we can proceed. She didn't say before, but in addition, you know, as we proceed. So that her book sounds really nuanced and interesting. Do you think it's online? Do you think people could access it still? Or do you think it was taped and it'll be up or what? Maybe. We accessed it through the California African American Museum, I think. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, it was good. And what, she's making appearances all around to promote her book. The, the group in Burlington is going to start their work on October 1st, and they're giving themselves a year to do you know, comprehensive research on mm -hmm. you know, Burlington and the part it played and how it benefited and, as you're saying, educating ourselves about what we were never taught. Mm -hmm. so, Do you think well, we should be doing this about Native Americans too? Well, th th there, there, there is a separate track that has already been happening in our legislature for the indigenous communities, right. and we re we've reported on it on previous yeah. shows, where the House has passed a resolution apologizing, and Chief Stevens of the Abenaki Nation in uh, Missisquoi stepped forward and said, this is the first step in healing. I mean, basically mm -hmm. saying, you know, I was wrong. I'm sorry. That's the first step in owning what it is you've done so that we can now figure out how we move forward together. How, so, how we can make it right. Yeah. Try to make it right. You know, you have to give all the land back. That would really be the ultimate way of making it right. But I don't see that happening. But where are you going to take me now? Well, I'm going to take you to two court victories for trans Americans. One court, one court affir uh, affirmation, students' rights, um, affirms, I'm sorry, my typing went together. Wacko. Together. <laughs> affirms trans students' right to use the restroom that matches their gender identity. And another that strikes down Idaho's ban on gender changes on birth certificates. So that's good news. And the first case was in Florida, right? Right. That was last week. No. I believe, wasn't it? No. No, I think the first case you mentioned oh, was, was in a Florida, Florida case. Yes, right. it was in Florida, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I typed, My typing all went together for some reason. Linda's using the new computer, too. I'm, I've got the old trusty dinosaur. <laughs> Help me prepare. But we digress. We do. Oh, let me see. Oh, yeah. Former WWE wrestler who has over 20 championships to his name says he killed a man who tried to rape him. Madi Janity, who was famous in the 80s, recently said in a post on Facebook that he made a man disappear behind a bowling alley when he was 13. I was buying some weed from a fag that worked there, Janity said. But the man pulled me into the alley, and that, and that was the man I disappeared. He is now 60. He said the man grabbed his crotch, so I beat him to death with a brick and put the body in the Chattanooga River. Police are investigating, and we'll keep you up, updated about whether this is actually a true story or... Uh, something he made up in his head or <coughs> whatever. Awful either way. I know. So um, we'll keep you informed as we hear more about that. Uh, Trump appointee who uh, said that the U.S. is a homo empire is fired. Merritt Corrigan was Deputy White House liaison to the U.S. Agency for International Development and anti-LGBTQ statements after her private Twitter account was unlocked. She said she was in horror this week as USAID 
distributed taxpayer-funded documents claiming that we cannot tell someone's sex or gender by just looking at them, and that not calling yourself cisgender is a microaggression. I'm not cisgender, I'm a woman, she said, and she intends to hold a press conference with Jacob Wall and Jack Berkman, who are well-known conspiracy theorists. Last year, they used a false media account to accuse Pete Buttigieg of sexually assaulting a young man. Wall has also faked death threats to himself, against himself. At the press conference, she will discuss the rampant anti-Christian sentiment at the USAID. So there you go. And All righty. And that. Adja Ra Raquel, phone Spears 33, <coughs> was attending a vigil of a murder victim, Terrell Penny, when she and one other person were stabbed. After the vigil, people moved to a home gathering. Um, first responders attempted to save her life and do life-saving procedures for her, but she was declared dead at the scene, and her death is considered a homicide. Portland police say no arrests have been made on, in that case. Was she stabbed in the home gathering? Or? No, after the gathering, they went back to a um, sort of like, um, uh, you know, another kind of vigil, but in somebody's yard. And, and that's where she was stabbed. And then some a fight broke out. Oh. And then, so, you know, the details of this are a little fuzzy because I don't know whether, it didn't say whether she was involved in the actual stabbing or she was involved in the fight or she had anything or she was a bystander. It really didn't have any information about that, so I really don't know. Uh, so, and Anderson, who owns a bakery with her wife, Michelle, felt this couldn't be what she thought it was, but it was. Uh, David Drake ordered a cake, and he's a member of the alt-right religious organization called Church Militant. But it's not really a church. It is a church in name only. It is a right-wing 501c nonprofit owned by St. Michael's Media. Its mission is to convert non-Catholics to the faith through social media. Their uh, former name was Catholic TV, but the Archdiocese of Detroit has asked the group not to use the name <coughs> Catholic. A recent article on their webpage was titled, The Gay Rainbow is the Mark of the Beast, and was <laughs> authored by Gordon the Man, who ordered the anti-LGBTQ cake. And I have a picture. So who's David Drake then? David Drake is the guy who called in the um, anti-LGBT cake to be, and he's also a member of this organization, Michael's Media. So that's who he is. <clears throat> and they're trying to convert. Do you want to be converted? No, but isn't the a proprietor of the cake shop a lesbian? Yes. Her name is Anderson, that's her last name, and she has a wife named Michael, Michelle. And did they deliberately target them? They did. Uh, they deliberately and targeted them. What did the them. cake say? The cake said um, Bite me. something from Corinthians, like um, oh. gay, a, okay. something from the Bible, like, you know, sodomy is whatever. I don't know. You know, because I know a prominent gay actor named David Drake. Different person, I Different imagine. one, I hope. So yeah, so they ordered they ordered it on purpose okay. to make a statement, um, and they made a cake, which said God loves everybody. And when He came for the cake, they gave Him that cake. So I mean, it was their reverse masterpiece cake. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, it was their way of yeah. trying to get that through the courts. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, sounds really interesting. Ratched. Ratched. Remember Ratched? Nurse yes. Ratched. Yes. Nurse Ratched. Nurse Ratched. Yeah. yeah. Is camp wrapped in noir in the description 
of the upcoming Netflix series from Ryan Murphy and Evan Romansky imagines the formative life of the young Milford Ratched from the sadistic nurse from 1975 no. film, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And it was no. a play, too. For no. the role for which Louise Fletcher won the Academy Award. I know. Siraj Paulson steps into the nurse ratchet role to explore the origins that made her the terror she is today. So, I've known some nurse ratchets. I know a couple. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not naming names. Of course so, not. No. Of course not. So it's kind of a <laughs> prototype. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me try to organize what's going on in Poland. I was just going to say before you finish, oh. a lot of people are doing like backstories things, you know, like, mm -hmm. and and this seems to be, uh, you know, another one of those backstories. Like, now we're going to learn about this horrible life of Nurse Ratched. But anyway, go ahead. And speaking of popular <laughs> culture, I I want to add, you know, you mentioned last time that Madonna said she was fined. Yeah. Um, oh, she was disputed. Yeah. 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 So she made it up. Yeah, and she's been in the news maybe as a, her remarks about coronavirus have been suspect, but mm -hmm. I, you know. Isn't I, she an anti-vaxxer? I'm not mm -hmm. sure anyway. Okay, well, let's go to Poland. Uh, and I've exceeded my number of pictures here um, <laughs> because I couldn't resist these three. Um, three people are charged with hanging rain, rainbow flags off statues. And Poland is marked by statues. Uh, the first one I'd like to show you is a statue of astronomer Copernicus, decked out with a rainbow flag and an anarchist face mask. So see that picture. Um, then um, the police have charged these three activists with doing it. The second picture I'd like to show you is of the mermaid of Warsaw <laughs> with a rainbow flag and an, uh, their anarcho-gay pink face masks. It's uh, the anarchy, anarcho-queer symbol is the pink face mask. Oh. So this statue, all statues are wearing it. And so the mermaid is an emblem of the city and features on its coat of arms. and features on its coat of arms. So look at the picture <laughs> and you'll find uh, a queer statement. And then the third and most disruptive uh, act of resistance concerns a monument of Jesus Christ. And oh. you can see the picture now before you, same rainbow flag, same pink mask. And I couldn't, you can't really tell in the picture, but it must be Christ because the, um, Monument is wearing like what presumably was the cross, so that you see a um, carrying the cross like you see a plank that I think is supposed to be the cross on the pictures. So anyway, these Polish activists put this up, and um, <laughs> outrage has ensued. Uh, Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki, Morawiecki oh. denounced the activist saying this statue symbolized values that are important to millions of Poles. The activists who were part of the demonstrations said they were protesting against the homophobic ideology of governing officials. Prosecutors must now decide whether to bring the case to court. In Poland, the crime of offending religious feelings, which is of course the Christ <laughs> monument, is punishable by a fine of up to two years in prison. So, okay, that's got to be against EU rules, too. Well, we're going to get to the oh, EU. Okay, go ahead. Next, thousands protest and demand the release of an LGBT activist who was involved with this action. Several thousand people waving rainbow flags have protested on Saturday in the center of Warsaw to demand the release of an LGBTQ activist who was involved in this hanging of the flags. Uh, she's also been charged with damaging an anti-abortion campaigner's van. Um, crowds in I the, like her already. the thousand, her name is Margot. She has a longer name, but she goes by um, the name of Margot. Um, 
The crowds have been chanting, give us Margot back. The rainbow does not insult you outside Warsaw's palace of culture. The peaceful gathering um, applauded act the activists hanging up the flags. On Friday, the police detained 48 people who were trying to stop the authorities from jailing Margot. The activists accused of hanging the flags. Um, we are here to protest against the fact that these people were detained by the police, a payroll specialist, 24, told Reuters. Okay. The police started releasing detained protesters on Saturday, but not Margot. She is a member of the activist group Stop Bidzurum, which means Stop Nonsense. The group have said they hung the flags last week as part of a fight for LGBT rights. The issue thrust into the heart of the public debate during last month's presidential election. Now, I've talked at length about this presidential election, how the mm -hmm. homophobe Duda won in a close election against the pro-gay mayor of Warsaw who lost. Mm -hmm. So now, let's go to the European Union. Okay. In July, the European Commission announced that it would de withhold developing f development funding for six Polish municipalities in reaction to their insistence of retaining the label of an LGBT-free zone. Authorities in one-third of Poland cities, which I think is about 80, um, have identified their localities as LGBT-free zones. Um, the courts attempted in 2019 to cur per curtail the pernicious anti-LGBT campaign. On August 6, an administrative court in Lublin annulled the anti-LGBT zone, the resolution declaring the zone. The European Commission and other, and this is an editorial from the writer of this article that is also informative, I think. The European Commission and other EU member states should also broaden the scope of their scrutiny in Poland under Article 7. And Article 7 is significant because it provides for sanctioning member states that breach core EU values to address Poland's breaches of the principles of non-discrimination and tolerance. So the ball is rolling with the EU, but there's Good. more they could do. Then there's more. Duda is, of course, elected and inaugurated. However, the Polish opposition members of parliament on Thursday, the day of his inauguration, formed a rainbow with their outfits at his swearing in. And now I have a, you can see it too. It's a picture right before you of um, the MPs from Poland's left grouping. They wore rainbow masks and outfits in shades of the rainbow, sitting in rows as Duda was sworn in on Thursday in the lower house of parliament, the Sem. They also posed in and outside Parliament with rainbow and white and red Polish flags, and that's the picture of them standing outside Parliament. We, might, we wanted to remind President Andrzej Duda that in, all, in, in the Constitution there is a guarantee of equality for all, said one of the left MPs. We don't want a similar situation during his next term as there was during his campaign where the president dehumanized LGBT people by denying them the right to be people. So Margot is transgender. Some um, activists have been released. Margot hasn't, and to just put icing on the cake, she's been imprisoned in a male jail. So we're hoping for her release, and thousands of people are supporting her. So oh, that's what's going on in Poland. It's been a tumultuous time. I heard that, um, I think I heard an interviewer from the U.S. interviewing, interviewing is it Duda? Duda. Duda. That, um, you know, they, they were asking him, well, how does it feel to be running a country that is so divided? And he said, no, 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 not divided, you know. I won in, you know, and she said, well, you know, it's like 50, 50 to 40, 51 to 49. Yeah. yeah. This is a divided. No, no, no. This is, you know, he had this whole thing about, you know, how 
everybody in Poland is with him, and this is not a divided country. <coughs> Sound familiar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a certain pattern. Yeah. Look at your inaugural pictures. Two stories quickly coming out of Canada. One, British Columbia, 43-year-old out gay man assaulted by seven other campers at the campsite. And Sean Dom, who is the man who was assaulted, said that they recognized him from a local grocery store where he and his ex-partner would go shopping that they yell pejorative terms at him, <coughs> called him a faggot, also called him a pedophile because his ex-boyfriend was younger. So, of course, if a fellow camper called the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who did respond, however, this case is still under investigation. It has not been charged as a hate crime yet because the, the people who called in the complaint couldn't identify the seven assailants. So, but Sean is saying that, you know, he has severe anxiety, oh, yeah. PTSD. I'm sure. He was treated for concussions. You know, that for him, this is an ongoing, and it's really shaken his sense of confidence of, here I was out and proud, and here is the response. Mm -hmm. This is what happened within my community. This happened ha in the campground. Were they people from the campground, or just no? They were all they were all in the campground. Okay. And but the flip side of that, Margaret McCabe, who we reported on in a previous show, Canadian Olympic swimmer, who in her press release said that there were no out LGBTQ plus swimmers. So she didn't have role models. She didn't have mentors. Mm. And that she felt that that actually delayed her own personal coming out process and her sense of awareness. And that there really needs to be out LGBTQ models in all sports, in all venues. And to that end, she has founded an organization called Head to Head which is bringing together former Olympic athletes to mentor our youth coming up. That's great. So, Very good. So it's to you. Well, you know, I don't, I, I'm done with my stories. Um, so oh, I, I yeah, know. but we got somebody on the end with a big pile I of papers. Know. And I know it, and I want And to she's talk. gritting. That's right, because <laughs> I'm very excited to have the chance to talk about Australia. I did my national news, so. Mm -hmm. Well, now let's talk about the uh, use of gender-neutral language in Australia. Yeah, okay. This guide recommends against using gendered terms like policeman, actress, and more. A proposed style manual released by the Australian government recommends gender-neutral language. Um, in the state official state content. This style manual was first released in 1966, and it's the rules governing the language of government workers in written and oral and public contexts. Um, the manual is available online. It advises all government officials and employees to use inclusive language that conveys gender equality and is gender, gender neutral. Avoid, workers need to avoid using job titles that end in man or woman, uh, or job terms that specify women. Gender is not relevant to a person's profession or title in general, the guide states. Use gender specific adjectives only when gender is relevant. So let's see some examples. Mary Corrigan would not like this. Do not use terms like policeman, clergyman, actress, hostess when referring to occupations. Instead, preferred terminology might include police officer, minister of religion, <laughs> actor, or host, noting that general neutral language respects people's preferences around gender and sexual identity. In addition to advising government officials not to default to gendered language and communications, the style, the style guide 
directs employees to ask others pronouns rather than assuming the gender with which they identify. When an individual's gender is unknown, such as during a first meeting, gender neutral pronouns are advised. If it's not clear and you can't ask them, choose gender neutral programs, the manual states. That's, I'm sorry, gender neutral pronouns. The singular they is gender neutral. It avoids specifying a person's gender. The manual also offers guidance on specific terminologies related to LGBTQ plus identities, such as terms like gender queer, intersex, and, non, and the non-binary honorific MX, mix, I don't know, mix, and instructs workers to continually educate themselves in order to stay informed. Follow the rule that people have the right to identify their sexual orientation and gender identity as they choose. Now, um, the new guidance has, has yet to be made permanent. Um, and in the past, this article says that some of the amendments to the manual of style have been controversial. But the main controversy in this regard concerns disability rights, apparently. Disability advocates have taken issue with a recommendation to use first-person language such as person with disability instead of disabled person. Opinions in the disability commun community vary on this subject, and critics argued that the government shouldn't have labeled one side of the debate as wrong. Oh. On a somewhat lighter note, grammarians are angry that the <laughs> that the manual advises the use of numerals on all numbers after one and spaces around M dashes. You know, M dashes. Yeah. According to The Guardian, one angry critic wrote on social media, you can, pry em, you can pry M dashes, yes, these ones, and then there are two M dashes displayed, out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> So we should have distance. such trouble here. Right. <laughs> oh my goodness! So what do we think? I don't know about this disability. I mean, differently abled is what I thought. Well, I when we were first starting to to do work on non discrimination language, the disability rights community approached me saying could you please define me as somebody living with a disability? So now, like, I, I, I am not, my disability does not define who I am as a person. It is one component of. So, but it, every time I hear these kinds of conversations, I always go back to, you know, Rather than asking the government, we should be asking the disability rights community, how is it that we should be addressing you? And then just change it. And well, and right. this now, this is there's going to be a period of feedback now okay. about this manual. That's pretty advanced, though, for, you know, to even start a project like that. Well, it's the yeah. style manual. I was thinking, you know, I, it's been so long since I belonged to the MLA, but that was kind of a normative style yeah. manual. Yeah. Um, I don't know what they're saying now, though. Yeah. But it's very interesting. Yeah. It is. It I is. think. I think. And, and it's an ongoing and evolutionary process. You're ready for the trivia questions, I think aren't we you? Do the, tri the trivia questions. So out in the mountains, I August. Know the answers now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wonder how you know the answers. I don't know. August 11th, 1994, Stowe Performing Arts Center. The performer who really, really liked the Alpine Slide. Okay. And she went on it, I want to say, three consecutive times. Oh. Might have been Melissa Etheridge. Yeah. August 1999, UVM. Publicity for their National Coming Out Day festivities, festivities in October. An evening with Ellen. Uh. And we were delighted by Ellen DeGeneres and then Anne Heche, yeah. who did a bit of a stand-up routine, and then answered questions back and forth. Was she a stand-up comedian, too, or was she just and, no, an Anne actress? No, Anne was an actress, yeah. yeah. Wow. So with that... Well, that sounds very good. Should we do a rendition of Come to My Window? 
isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. Don't you Thank you, Linda. How, um, I don't know. The, that's all I know. Anyway. Okay, on that. On that note, <laughs> let's all resist. resist.